2008, a gallon of gasoline hit $4. It was the highest price it had ever been. And like many of you, I was interested in trying to use less gas, partly because of the cost, but also because of the long-term effect on the environment. And so a colleague at Fuqua, Jack Saul and I, started to carpool in his hybrid. And one of the interesting features the hybrid had was a cool screen that you see in the middle of this picture that showed the MPGs we were getting as we were driving to work. So um, we both like numbers, and he started to ask me quizzes uh, about MPG. And one, of, one example of it was, imagine you drove uphill for 100 miles, and you got 10 miles per gallon. And then imagine you turned around and drove back the same 100 miles downhill, but got 100 miles per gallon. What was your average miles per gallon? So this is, he was giving me little quizzes like this. And it turns out I was failing the quizzes. I was not doing the right math with MPG. And it led us both to think about, well, what information do we have available to make smart energy decisions? And can we improve that information? And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Now, MPG is very familiar to Americans. And in fact, because we think it's important to reason with MPG, the EPA in the 1970s said every new car needs to have it on the side of the vehicle. And anyone who's bought a new car has seen an updated version of this sticker that's now been around for a long time. So can we make good decisions with MPG? That's essentially the challenge. Now, the idea of studying good decision making really has this interesting history because two different disciplines have focused on our decision making. And really, they worked in separation for many years. So one is economics, where economics assumes that we're very rational as we make decisions. We're fully informed. We calculate everything correctly. We're going to maximize the money for ourselves. At the same time, psychology was studying many questions about decision making, but they were taking different assumptions to it, that we rely a lot on our intuition, that we don't have full information, therefore, that we um, have complex interests, and that we take a lot of shortcuts. And what's interesting about these two parallel fields was at, at, they eventually started to speak to each other. And there was a recognition that we really have to work in a space between the rational assumptions in economics and these problems that psychology had identified. And so the field of behavioral economics emerged, which really looks at the overlap. Let's accept that people don't make great decisions. What can we do to help them make better decisions? Now, Daniel Kahneman uh, was a Nobel Prize winning uh, psychologist who happened to win the Nobel Prize in economics. And he did it because he essentially spoke to economists and gave them systematic evidence that people are uh, systematically deficient in how they make decisions. And in a 2011 book called Thinking Fast and Slow, he coined a phrase, wiziati, which simply means what you see is all there is. And by that, he meant to say that when people get information, they get trapped by it. They do a poor job of figuring out how to convert it into something they really care about, and they just try to work with whatever they see. And what I'm going to do today is try to give you four principles for getting better information when you make a car buying decision, and in fact, general decisions about energy use. And it creates an acronym of CORE, C-O-R-E. So I'm going to tell you to focus on consumption metrics, which I'm going to illustrate for you that you should know your objectives, meaning in the end you don't care about gas, you care about costs and the environment. So know what you're trying to achieve and get information on it. There's a value of relative comparisons. It's often hard to make sense of numbers without knowing how big or small they are compared to something else. And then finally, expand outcomes. Don't think about this week's gas consumption, but think about the effect of owning one vehicle over another over the course of a year or seven years. All right, let's do a quick quiz. So imagine a family has two vehicles. They drive both the same distance over the course of a year, and they can trade in one, and they want to get a more efficient one. One possibility would be to trade in a 10 MPG vehicle for a 20 MPG vehicle. And the other is to trade in a 20 MPG vehicle for a 50 MPG vehicle. Now, which of these trade-ins do you think will save more gas for the family? So raise your hand. How many think A would save more gas? All right, how about B? OK, I think I saw more hands for B, and that's, in fact, what most people say. B is very attractive because it's a bigger difference. 20 to 50 is a 30 mile per gallon difference. And it's a bigger percentage improvement if you're trying to think in, ter in percentage terms. It turns out that's wrong. A, in fact, saves more gas. In fact, it saves almost twice as much gas as B does. Now, here's the math that helps make that clear. Uh, in this table, on the left-hand side is miles per gallon. And they're not spaced equally, and you'll, you'll soon see why that's the case. The right-hand column tells you how much gas you're going to use driving 100 miles 
with a vehicle that has that MPG. And the math is simple. You just divide the 100 by the MPG and you get the gallons of gas. But the clear thing that pops out here is that every MPG improvement in the teens tends to be very helpful in reducing a gallon of gas that's being used. And if you look at the change then from 10 to 20, as I had proposed in the slide before, you can see you're going from using 10 gallons of gas down to five. You're saving five gallons of gas with that trade-in. If you look at the 20 to 50 improvement, you're going from using five gallons down to two, that's only a three gallon savings. And it's just very counterintuitive to people that there's such a curvilinearity, which I'll also show in the next graph, but, but one striking thing here is that a 10 to 11 improvement is about the same magnitude of benefit as a 33 to 50. They save the same amount of gas, one gallon every 100 miles. And so um, those of you who are more visual and think in terms of graphs, this is a graph of miles per gallon along the x-axis and then the amount of gas you use per 100 miles on the y-axis. And the same problem that we just saw, 10 to 20 reduces the gas that you use by five gallons, 20 to 50 reduces it by only three. And so the implication of this is Think in terms of consumption of gas, not MPG, but instead this measure of gallons per 100 miles, because then you can actually get an accurate picture of how much gas you're going to use when you compare one vehicle to another. So that's principle number one. Look at consumption. Look at gallons per 100 miles. Now, a second principle is be aware of what your objectives are and make sure you get information that helps you figure out whether you're achieving those objectives. In a set of studies with um, other colleagues, we had people think about the trade-off between buying a cheaper car, let's say a $20,000 vehicle that gets 20 miles per gallon, and a more expensive car, $25,000 car, but one that gets 30 miles per gallon. Is that MPG improvement, which means you're gonna have lower gas costs in the future, worth the additional costs up front? Now, the objectives that people care about are things like costs and also the environmental impact. And one of the insights we had was that we thought that when people just use MPG, they may not know the full implications for those other things, the costs and the environmental impact. And so we did a study where we measured people's attitudes about the environment. Are they essentially kind of hostile to the environment, uh, low, low in terms of their pro-environmental attitude, or are they very high? And on the x-axis on this graph, you can see it's ranging from a, a, a red um, minus sign up to a green plus sign. So this is our way of trying to capture their prior attitudes toward the environment. And when we told them the kind of choice that you just saw, and we looked to see, are they willing to buy the more efficient car, we found that they weren't acting on their attitudes, these environmental attitudes. They seemed to be uh, kind of, no matter what your attitudes were, you had a favorable attitude toward the car, but you weren't sensitive to your own preferences. But we realized that if we can actually give people something other than fuel cost as the indicator of how efficient the car is, and we gave them greenhouse gas emissions and environmental income, suddenly people then began to act on their stable internal attitudes toward the environment. And we think of this as a kind of signpost effect. It's sometimes you have to be reminded about where you wanna go and how to get there. And so there's a value then to having cars labeled not just with MPG and fuel costs, but with a greenhouse gas rating so that people remember to act on it and know how to act on it. Okay. Um, if you got a natural gas bill and you found out that you, you were using 163 therms of natural gas, would you know whether this is a bad or a good thing? Most people have no idea what a therm is. So it's hard to know whether this is a lot or a little, whether you're doing well or doing poorly. And so a third basic principle is the value of a relative comparison for energy numbers because we often don't know what's big and what's small. And one of the interesting pioneers in this space that really has made a lot of progress helping us understand the psychology of how people make these decisions is a company called Opower, which took social psychology research from about 10 years ago, redesigned the kinds of labels and um, feedback sheets that we get in our mail about our energy use, and essentially created a comparison for where you are, where all of your neighbors are, and then in some cases where the most e efficient neighbors are in terms of their overall energy use. And what's clever about this is because it's a comparison to your neighbors, it means that they live in the same climate as you, they tend to live in the same size house and age house, and so it's a fair apples to apples comparison. 
And now in the case of this example, if you find out that you're using 163 therms, you find out that you are actually worse than the average neighbor, and it might lead you to reflect on, what am I doing differently? What could I do to become more efficient and save money and help the environment, whatever my concerns are? So uh, there's just a recognition that if we give people comparisons, it can motivate them to catch up with their neighbors. Uh, and then the value of having the efficient neighbor number, which of course here is very low, meaning it's very good, allows those who are already better than average to have yet another goal to strive for and want to catch up with. So the comparison helps motivate us to do a better job. All right, and then a final principle um, is the value of looking at larger numbers and thinking in terms of expanded outcomes rather than um, kind of small ones. And I'm going to use a non-energy example to illustrate this because it does a good job of illustrating it and then come back to energy. So a few colleagues and I presented um, subjects with a choice of two cell phone plans. Plan A had a uh, higher price per year, but it had fewer dropped calls per 100 calls. And you can think of dropped calls as being a quality measure. So you want fewer of them. You don't want to get disconnected. So plan A had 4.2 dropped calls per 100 for a price of $384. Um, plan B had more dropped calls, 6.5, um, but at a lower price, $324 per year. But if you look at these numbers, the drop call difference doesn't seem very large. Four and six, that doesn't seem very different. And that yearly cost of 60 bucks seems pretty big. So most people in this case favor um, B when they have a preference. They'd rather choose the cheaper plan that's gonna make them suffer more dropped calls. But here's the interesting thing. We gave another group of subject the a different frame, but essentially the same information. In fact, identical information, just a rescaling of it. We had them think about dropped calls per thousand, so it's 42 versus 65, and the price was expressed as per month rather than per year, so 32 versus 27. Well, now the price difference looks small. It's only $5 a month, and boy, I'm gonna save 20 dropped calls over the next thousand that I make, and with this reframing, we now have a majority of the people wanting to pay for the more expensive and higher quality plan. But the information is identical. So the fact that we can be moved around based on how we scale information, first of all, says a lot about our nature. We get trapped by what we see. This is Kahneman's point. But the other is we can use this responsibly by trying to make important things bigger so we see the actual impact of them. And so here's what I mean in the sense of energy, which is earlier I argued we don't want to think about miles per gallon, we want to think about gallons per some distance. So one possible distance is 100 miles. So if I think about improving a car from 20 to 25, I know I'm going to reduce my gas consumption from five gallons every 100 miles down to four. That's good, but five to four doesn't sound that impressive to me, and I might be fine with the, five, the car that uses five gallons every 100 miles. But now if you tell me over what I hope to be the life of my car, about 100,000 miles, that the difference is gonna be from 5,000 gallons down to 4,000, that gets my interest. I don't wanna burn that extra 1,000 gallons. I don't wanna pay for it, and I don't want it to hurt the environment, and now I think I'm more likely to act on it. And so, as we think about then improving decisions for people, what information we can give them, and what you wanna look for the next time you're buying a car, the EPA label was redesigned in 2013 to try to offset the bad MPG number with other valuable information. And let me highlight some of these for you. So um, MPG is still on the label. So uh, people want it, they, they expect it, but now there's more stuff. So one is this smaller number, which is the gallons per 100 miles recommendation that Jack Saul and I made in a science article in 2008. So that gets us into consumption and away from MPG. So that's a step in the right direction. They have annual fuel cost on there. That's also good. It's a translation to an objective we care about, which is cost. They also have greenhouse gas ratings. This is that signpost of helping people who want to help the environment get directed in the right direction for it. And then finally, the, the last number that I think is quite clever combines several of the principles that I just proposed, which is they make a comparison to an average car, so it's relative, and you can see whether you're saving money or spending extra. They scale it over five years, so it's a bigger number. It gets closer to the kind of lifetime of the car that you're going to have. And um, you can essentially then quickly size up how big an impact you're having. If you buy an SUV that has poor mileage, this is no longer a savings number. This is an extra cost number that's in the thousands of dollars at that point. 
And then finally, as, as you leave today, and if you're thinking about buying a car in the future, um, Duke has put together a calculator that allows you to enter MPG numbers for maybe your current vehicle and one you might trade for or three that you're considering, and you can put in the MPG, some distance you expect to drive, and I'd recommend pick a big one, like the lifetime of the car, so you really see the impact of your numbers, make a gasoline price assumption, and then you can compare the vehicles to see how much you're saving or how much extra you'd spend, depending on which one you pick. So this is just zooming in, you get a final number that's a comparison between the vehicles, whatever, you, whatever assumptions you wanna make. And you can find this easily, it's at a URL, gpmcalculator.com, and uh, it will help you when you make your next car decision. So as you walk away then with this recognition of the problem of what you see is all there is, we can help you make better decisions by making sure when you look at the label or use the calculator, you're thinking in terms of consumption, not MPG. You're thinking in terms of the costs and the environmental impact. You get a sense of this relative comparison across people or between vehicles, and you think about the big outcomes over many miles of driving and not just 100 miles. Thank you.